telemedicine. People in telemedicine for 20 years have been a little bit shy. You know, we like to explain what this does, and we like to have a little bit of money in this hand. It's time we stop that. You know, we have about 20 million people, 30 million, and so we can talk to you about come on the healthcare roles. We have no idea how we're going to handle that. Telemedicine is going to be the solution for everything, but it's going to be a tool that is going to be incredibly important to put forward. And we've got to move out on that. Not in 10 years, not in two years. We've got to move out on that this year. That's why we're pushing state legislation in every state. We've got to move on right away because, frankly, healthcare is going to hit us in the face if we don't do something right away. It's the beginning of the end of fee for service. As I said, 80 million Americans, about 25%, are covered under managed care right now. In about two years, we estimate it'll be about a third of all Americans that are in this large managed care capitated payment, which means anybody can do telemedicine for them anytime they want. We don't have to wait for fee for service. That's an important message that is really available to start rolling out these services today. You just got to figure out the right way to do it. And finally, I guess what we've shifted in terms of government is we've been talking for a long time about government helping support telemedicine. It's on a roll right now so much that really what government needs to do is get out of the way. If you look at even in your own area, Mercy Health System, I don't know if anybody's here from Mercy Health, I think there have been a few. Uh, the CEO, you know, Lynn Britton, spoke at our annual meeting this year. I, I made sure he spoke. I'm, I'm a great fan of his because they're moving out to build a virtual health center. They have facilities in four states. He's really a leader. It used to be if you had a clinical champion, that was really great to move out of telemedicine. Right now, what we have is the CEOs of healthcare systems. I'll give you, give you one final example of what I mean by where telemedicine is going. Uh, John Noseworthy, who's the CEO of Mayo Clinic, has a vision. He says, we're going to touch 200 million lives by the year 2020. The Mayo's have touched 200 million lives. They're right now they have a facility in Rochester, Minnesota, one in Florida, and one in Arizona. They're not going to have a lot, they're not going to have 200 million people in their facilities. What they're going to do is they're going to have relationships and facilities with hospitals and networks all over the country. Last year I was in Billings, Montana. Uh, speaking to one of our past presidents, Selma Armstrong, I had a conversation with the chief medical officer of Billings Clinic, a great facility. Um, and I was telling him about what Mayo's doing with the Mayo Network. And he said, well, they're not in this state, they're not in Montana. And his assistant leaked up to him and said, well, I'm sorry, sir, they were in the office last week. And uh, what's happened is Billings Clinic, now if you look at it, it says Billings Clinic, an affiliate of the Mayo Network. And what's happening is they're moving out in every state. <laughs> Who else is moving out in every state is the Cleveland Clinic. In Washington, D.C., we have two major health facilities, Georgetown and Washington Hospital Center, that are now affiliates of the Cleveland Clinic. Hopkins, out of Baltimore, is doing the same thing. How are they doing this affiliation? What are they doing? The backbone the tool they're using is telemedicine, or what Mayo calls e-consults, because they want to have people, no matter where you are, have access to their health providers. It is a major change to what's happening in healthcare. The head of Dartmouth says, Within 10 years, we're probably going to go down to about 19 health systems in the entire country. It's the Walmartization of, of what's going on in healthcare. It's an exciting time. It's kind of a scary time for some people because it is competitive, but it's moving out right away. Last thing is the all the, when I talk about the Walmartization, the other thing that's happening. I don't have a slide for this, but uh, Walmart installed in their stores in Alabama. I know you guys are eating, so uh, don't mind me. Um, it really is great to be here. I, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, actually, I'm born in Chicago, so I, I feel a real affinity to this area. But I've been on the road for three or four weeks, so I really haven't kept the news up. When I was flying in St. Louis, I thought, it's been a while since I've been here. I didn't realize you had so many lakes. And then I realized, oh, you have a lot of rain. Uh, I really think it was uh, some embarrassing. So this is the 20th anniversary of, of ATA. And uh, I was years old when it started. Um, it's been a hard year. Mike Caputo, who's in the audience, has been, uh, we were just reminiscing about the, the old times of, of ATA. When we started, no one knew anything about telemedicine. Uh, or those who did really opposed telemedicine because we were a threat. And I think some of that is still around, but it's really changed. Just to give you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about federal policy in a second, but just to give you an idea about how much has changed. Last year, in the United States, 10 million people got services of some sort remotely. 
use of telemedicine. Now, about half of those will be radiology, but there's about a million patients that have a cardiac implantable pacemakers and other types of uh, arrhythmia devices that are monitored. Uh, and you know, it goes on and on and on. About 10% of ICU beds are remotely monitored. Um, for stroke care, in terms of how many emergency rooms, it's amazing how many have telestroke. It's a major program throughout the country. It's really amazing. Uh, I was in the UK uh, last week, last week, and uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron, just announced a 3 million lives program which is aimed at expanding the use of telehealth throughout the United Kingdom. So that really goes a long way when you have the Prime Minister leading the campaign saying we got to have more adoption of telehealth. For them, telehealth is the remote monitoring that all is where they primarily focus. So it's an amazing time. Uh, we talk about, uh, somebody mentioned about insurance companies. You know, earlier this year, Aetna and WellPoint announced that they are now fully reimbursing uh, online consults. Online consults with the doctors. You can see the doctor, and then they have some companies, WellPoint, Teladocs, a few of the others they're contracted with. Uh, United Healthcare, they're just just left United as the chief medical officer. Reed Tuxi is in line to be our, our president in two years. Uh, so, you know, it, it's an amazing time how that's changed so much. Um, but it's still, it, it's, it's still interesting because we talk all about the large numbers in telemedicine and some of the things that are happening. But it really gets down to personal. And one of my favorite stories is early on when ATA was founded, I, I had a meeting with the U.S. Senator Judd Gray, which at the time he was representing New Hampshire. And uh, he was not a friend of telemedicine. He didn't like it. He just, he just didn't know anything about it. So I went and explained to people. And we were chatting for a little bit. And it was interesting because there was a pause in the conversation. He kind of looked away and said, You know, my mother. That was it. That was it. That's all you had to do. Because you knew you had it. Because it turns out his mother had a chronic disease. She could use remote monitoring. And he did start using remote monitoring of his mother. He turned out to be an advocate. So it really gets down to the person. It really gets down to what it does to change your life. Um, and that's been such a great trip with ATA for these many years uh, to see what's happened. So let me. Uh, Go over a few things here in terms of where we're at in telemedicine. Apparently, not much going on. <laughs> oh, starting out with payments. So, I'm going to cover three or four of the major issues that are happening and kind of give you some up to date of uh, what's happening. And some is good news and some is bad news. And of course, we start immediately with the traditional Medicare, Medicare reimbursement. Unfortunately, that's in the unhappy face area. Um, and it's not that we haven't had progress, we have. Um, but uh, a lot of the Medicare reimbursement for live video conferencing is only for areas that are outside of the metropolitan area, the non SMSA, as they call it. Unfortunately, the federal government just reclassified SMSAs and they added like 47 counties that used to be eligible for Medicare reimbursement and now they're not. Uh, so we're taking a step backwards on that. We're trying to do some work with Congress to get a change, but right now there's some counties that were eligible and are actually not eligible for Medicare reimbursement right now. Coding, right now they, they reimburse it on the fee-for-service side. They reimburse it on, uh, by CPT codes. And every year, if you want to add another CPT code, you have to petition them. You have to down their knees and say, free please, and they give a lot of information they consider and they said they go away. So we've been doing that for about 10 years with them. But it's, we've gotten a few codes along the way. It has some small increases, but it's not all bad. Uh, they had a, a, a new rule on, on privileging, and uh, they're traditionally privileging, that came out last year. Maryland's Habit was just uh, approved by the Senate to be the uh, administrator of the Center for Medicare Services. She actually is a great friend for telemedicine. Uh, she was head of uh, health care in Virginia, did a lot of work there. When she first came into Medicare, one of her first meetings was with us on the issue of traditionally privileging. And she pledged they would resolve that problem. We can get into some of the details if there's questions later, but uh, but that's some good news. So that's kind of the bad news part of it. But then there's there's some good news too. And let's talk first of all about the good news. And I'm going to hold everything right there. I can see it here too. Amazing. The big news is fee for service is on a gradual now, we're not there. It's going to be a long time. But if you look what's happening, we've changed the way we pay for health care. 
we are starting to change it. Away from fee-for-service, where you get a reimbursed every time you go to the doctor's office, to capitated <coughs> care organizations, one phrase, state the Medicaid managed care, uh, the, the Medicare Advantage, medical and health homes, abundant payments, all these types of things. What that means basically is Mrs. Jones, you get X amount of money to take care of Mrs. Jones over the next period of time. Now that is really the sweet spot for telemedicine. If you have to pay for every time you use this electronic stethoscope, all of a sudden the numbers start building up and the resentments start building up. But if you pay for her care, and you can use the technology to pay for her care, then everybody will use it because it's a no-brainer. Uh, telemedicine makes sense, and that's what's going to happen. So if you look at, for example, the Veterans Administration, I'll mention this later. Uh, the Veterans Administration pays for qualified veterans for the rest of their life for health care. So they have a capitated system they're paying for that care. The Veterans Administration is one of the largest users of telemedicine. 500,000 services were remotely provided last year uh, with the Veterans Administration's programs. And there's about 80,000 veterans that are in your home getting remote monitoring. They're doing it very quickly, and they're doing it very effectively because they know that's the way to move it. So as we move from the rest of the country going into this capitated managed care type of approach, we're going to see an explosion in telemedicine. And of course, people talk about health reform. Many of you who are in health care know all about that. We are going to get a bunch of people coming on with health care roles. Most of them will go into probably the state Medicaid managed care program. And so there's a potential opportunity to really expand. We still have a few issues on the federal level. For example, there's accountable care organizations, which is basically a large hospital system will take care of uh, the patients no matter where they're located, nursing home, rehabilitation, whatever. But they still have some of the old rules facing them about you only pay for it if it's in a non-metropolitan area. So there's complications, and I won't get into details, but we're moving ahead very quickly but it's not of the traditional fee-for-service system. So the first rule is when you hear, oh, telemedicine can't move forward because we can't get the fee-for-service thing done, well, you know what? We're moving ahead very rapidly. And the fee-for-service is, is a barrier still, but it's becoming a smaller barrier every year because healthcare is moving beyond it. And telemedicine is being moved beyond it. So that's a really important message to find out. Um, so the other area that's growing, as I mentioned, the Veterans Administration, is the government programs. You know, the government is not only a funder of telemedicine, they're a provider of telemedicine. The Veterans Administration, the military, you know, the TRICARE system, uh, the Indian Health Service, the Federal Department of Justice. Uh, one of our staff members, Jordana Bernard, many, many years ago drafted the original plan for the Department of Justice putting in telemedicine into the prisons. It's one of the fastest growing uses of telemedicine. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Who wants to take a prisoner out of prison into a local doctor's office? Uh, if you can serve them somehow in their own facilities, which are more and more rural, then it really saves a huge amount of money. It's why almost every state in the country are moving very rapidly toward using telemedicine in their correctional prisons and in their correctional facilities. California just made a huge move uh, this last year to adopt it, and it's in the millions of dollars that they're putting in because it's a cost-effective measure. So when you get to these capitated ways of spending for these large systems, then you know that it, it really started making sense. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of some of the things that are going on. Let me move on to um, the Medicaid programs. Uh, every state does Medicaid. Um, this is a map of, you can't see it real well, but uh, in the gray states are the states that have enacted bills this year on expanding telemedicine. Uh, the yellow ones are the ones that are proposing this year. So what's happened in, in generally the words of the world of, of public policy on the state level, it's where the action is. It is unbelievable that we've had more legislative activity this year than in any other year we've had in public. Um, for example, we have 10 states that right now have active Medicare is more than that there, but right now there's 10 states with active Medicaid proposals uh, that's moving forward, but even more signed into law. Uh, one of the organizations of state legislators called the Nobel Women, which is a national organization of black elected legislative women, a very powerful group, and a lot of people do. But they're all state legislators from around the country. Their number one priority this year is telemedicine. The uh, Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators, their number one priority this year is telemedicine. So you see 
bills being proposed in almost every state legislative body this year. Now, not all of them are going to pass. It takes sometimes two or three years to get to pass. But all of a sudden, we're seeing a lot of active folks out there. You need to understand that in your states, your legislation, your legislators, your state legislators are on the front line of moving telehealth out. And they've really got to commit this. It's incredible to see what we've seen this, this last year. So this is just where it's going on under Medicaid. Um, mandated coverage, of course, every state regulates private insurance in that state. Um, there are uh, 18 states that now have a law in the books that mandate private providers reimbursed for telemedicine. There are another eight states right now that are proposing bills for this year. So all of a sudden, we're seeing a majority of states